You're now experiencing data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing Data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. Dr. Bob Hayes is a data scientist, blogger, and recently named Top 50 Digital Influencer for 2019, who I discovered while researching the types of non-technical challenges that data scientists face. Bob wrote a great blog post summarizing the findings of this uh, survey by Kaggle, and I wanted him to come on the show to specifically discuss three of the non-technical challenges that the survey uncovered. These three challenges are similar to the types of problems that the field of service design and product management often address. And on this episode, we explore some of these parallels from Bob's perspective. So if you work in data science or analytics or you're a product manager working with data scientists, I think you'll find today's episode exploring these challenges interesting. And here we go with Bob Hayes. All right, we're back with Bob Hayes. Uh, Dr. Bob Hayes, actually, you are a data scientist. Is that correct? People have called me that, yes. <laughs> Not only that, you're a, you're a top 50, was it an uh, AI and analytics influencers? Is that oh, what I recently saw come across my LinkedIn feed? That sounds about right. Yeah, I thought that, yeah. was, uh, that was really cool to see, see some names I know, and including Thank yours. You. I forget how we met exactly, but I've been enjoying, uh, you're, you're pretty active on LinkedIn, uh, posting uh, what's going on in kind of the world of data and data science and uh, analytics. Uh, so I thought you might be an interesting guest uh, to come and talk specifically about a survey. You, you had written an article for your, uh, your business. Um, you used to be uh, 100% f- consulting oriented, correct, with Business Over Broadway? Is that, is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Now I, I work for a company called Indigo Slate. I'm the research research director there uh-huh. and we're, we're we want to infuse research and analytics into everything that we do so i was i got hired on there probably a couple months ago and i love it i love it there awesome awesome well uh previously i think this is about a year ago you had written an article summarizing some of the findings that were in a, a kaggle survey of uh, challenges for data scientists and in particular uh, i wanted to to talk to you a little bit about some of the non-technical ones there, because a lot of these remind me of uh, activities that um, product and service designers uh, are. It's it's similar challenges that usually result from, at least in my experience, a, a lack of of getting cross-team collaboration, getting the right, right stakeholders involved, understanding goals and metrics. So, uh, so. If, Today, that's that's what we wanted to uh, get your expertise and your thoughts on were some of those findings. So can you talk first, maybe give a little bit of background on just yourself and, and then we can go into some of those findings, but what kinds of work are you doing today and, and what are what are your current, what's your current opinion on what the non-technical challenges are uh, in doing effective data science and analytics today? Okay, sure. Uh, my background, I have a PhD in industrial organizational psychology, and that's simply psychology applied to the world of work. Um, and my consulting research has revolved around uh, the areas of customer experience management, customer loyalty measurement, and just the practice of data science. I want to I understand you know, how teams can be more effective in, in applying the principle of data science in their jobs. So my research kind of revolves around those those key areas. I've always loved data. I took my first stats course in college uh, over 30 years ago, and I was hooked immediately. I mean, I loved data. And sometimes I introduce myself as a data-holic. <laughs> so I love it. That's a new one. <laughs> yeah. <heard> so, <laughs> so, so Kaggle does an annual study. I think they this is their third year coming up this year. And they survey a bunch of data pros from around the world on various topics around data science, what data they use, the challenges they face, the skills they have, and so forth. And the blog you're referring to, they had a list of, you know, one of the top challenges of of, uh, applying data science and work. There were a lot of things that surfaced, and I'm not surprised because you you find this in other kinds of of work as well. A a lot of the challenges revolve around non-technical things like just working together, having the right skill sets, and so forth. So... 
So it's, it's, it seems it, I, I've found the same kind of or similar results in my research on best practices and customer experience management programs. So the, you got pretty much the same roadblocks. You, you know, the, the results aren't applied to, to uh, business decision making. Uh, teams don't work uh, together effectively. So you have these common themes that kind of uh, cover just the, the, the culture, the, the social aspect of the workplace. And those seem to have a big impact on whether or not uh, a team can be successful or not. It's not just about skills or the technology. It's about, you know, how, how, the, how the, the people work together. Yeah. So let's, let me summarize what these kind of three topics were and then, and maybe mm-hmm. we can pick them apart separately. So sure. the, the, the three findings that I, I found were pretty interesting there were, uh, Uh, Number one was um, lack of a a clear question to be answering or a clear direction to go in with the available data. The second one was data science results were not used by the business decision makers. Uh, And the third one was uh, an inability to integrate findings into the organization's decision making processes. So right. um, maybe if we go in order, can you, t- can you speak a little bit to maybe your experiences and, and what you think might be going on with, uh, with the first of these? So that was the lack of a clear question to be answering or a clear direction to yeah. go in. I'm a big fan of just kind of analyzing data, you know, just getting my, my hands on data, just exploring it. But that can lead you down a, a path of no return where you're just analyzing data just to analyze it. So what I try to tell my clients is that when you approach a data set, have a problem that you're trying to solve. You know, and, and that, that, that roadblock or that challenge, I think it stems from the fact that a lot of data science teams don't have a subject matter expert on the team to, you know, to kind of pose the, pose the, right, the, the right questions. So for example, if you're, if you're trying to study you know, the, uh, or cancer treatments, you should have an oncologist on your team because that oncologist knows all the variables at play, knows about treatment options and so forth. And if you don't, you're going to miss out on opportunities of asking questions that you even, don't even know how to ask. Okay, so the, first of all, have, have somebody on the team who has good content domain knowledge. If, you're, if you want to talk about improving the marketing process, have a marketer on your team. If you're talking about improving uh, call support, then have a support person on your team. So I think that the key there is to have the right people on the team to ask the right questions. And not only that, it's good to have, it's good to be precise with your language. So in, in my work, you know, we, I try to in, improve customer loyalty for my clients, right? So you can say, like, oh, the, one of the problems could be like, oh, I want to increase loyalty because I want to have my business grow. Now, now, a lot of people equate customer loyalty with just recommendation behavior, like how likely are you to recommend this company to your family and friends. But there are other kinds of loyalty metrics out there. And if you just stick with one, the recommend question or the recommend uh, component of loyalty, then you're missing out on, on trying, to, trying to retain your customers or trying to upsell and cross-sell uh, other products to them. Right. So, so to be precise, we talk about customer loyalty. It's not customer loyalty you're trying to optimize. You see there, you're trying to optimize uh, retention rates. You're trying to optimize how many new customers you get. Or you're trying to optimize how many products or, or services you can upsell and cross sell to your existing customers. So be precise with your measurement and your outcomes. And you know, I think that'll go a long way in helping you, you know, at, ask the right questions and be precise about, about the things you're trying to optimize in your, in your modeling. It, it was interesting to me that this was the fourth, I think this was the fourth uh, biggest challenge that was cited with 22% of respondents saying this was, was an issue. So it, it suggested to me that respondents actually proceeded with these projects or these data science efforts despite not having this question uh, stated or a problem to work on. So do you think this is an equal problem between the the data team, the data, the data scientist is, is the the top of that team, I'm not sure how they're all structured, not having the soft skills to help the non-data stakeholders surface their true objectives, or is it more of that you feel like the business doesn't know how to pose questions and they're, they're asking for like right. AI and, and data science solutions without really having any type of problem? Like, where's that responsibility? Do you think it's a training issue for like non-technical skills that the data team needs to have, or is it more the business needs to work on being able to ask better questions with some understanding of how it might tie back to actionable data. Like where does it, where does that fall? Right. Right. Well, I think that 
I don't want to blame any one particular job role or anything like that. I think it's, again, it's working together. So in, I did a study a few years ago on, on the data science skills needed to be successful in, in your work, right? And I found that data science skills fall into three broad buckets that we've always talked about. You know, you got the, 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 the subject matter expert skills, whether it be business, whatever you kind of study. The second set of skills are around math and stats. So how do you analyze data? And the, the last skill, the third skill, uh, is technology and programming is, you know, how do you get access to the data you need? How do you program, you know, algorithms and machine learning algorithms and so forth? So if you understand that, that there's three skill sets and, and typically people fall into one of those buckets. You're either an expert in, in, in the content domain or stats and math or technology programming. It's, it's hard to find somebody who's skilled at everything. So what I try to do is I try to, I, sh I show them the scientific method. It's a pretty straightforward process from data to insights. And it's been used by, you know, by scientists for uh, hundreds of years, right? And it's really five steps are first you identify a problem statement. The next thing you do, step two, is you, you state some hypotheses or some hunches about what you think might, what you might find. Uh, the third step is you gather or you generate the data. The fourth step is you analyze that data. And the fifth step is you take action or communicate the results to the, the powers that be, right? So if you lay this out, this five-step process, you can see of those three job roles, the, the, the SME, the stats person, and the tech person, you can see where they might fit into this, this whole scientific approach. So, for example, the... Um, the, uh, the, the pose, the, the problem, the problem statement, right? You need somebody who knows what they're talking about. So you need the subject matter expert. So that's where the person comes in and here's my problem. And here's what I want to do. The next one is you say some hypotheses and that could involve the stats math person to make sure you're pretty precise in your language about what you're trying to study, what outcomes you're trying to optimize or maximize. And then you, and then you gather the data and that might require the technologist or programmer in order to get access to that data, in order to give it to the stats person, in order to analyze the data for the business person. So if you kind of look at the whole life cycle of, of from data to insights and you show them this is the kind of steps you go through, then I think it'll help, it'll help them see where they can contribute the most with the skills that they have. And I think that's a good, a good first step is to know where your limits are and what other kinds of of team members you're going to have to have on your team in order to be successful in applying analytics to, uh, to solve a particular problem. You're listening to Experiencing Data, the podcast that explores how design and user experience make enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. Your host is Brian O'Neill of Designing for Analytics, designer, UX consultant, and advisor to the business leaders behind custom enterprise data products and analytics applications. For more information, visit designingforanalytics.com. If you're enjoying the show, help Brian out by rating it on iTunes. And now, back to Brian. Are there particular um, activities or tactics or things that, that these data teams should be doing to get better involvement from their subject matter expert uh, colleagues, for example, or the other departments? Do you think, do you think there's a, a gap there or something in terms of how, how they're supposed to integrate and work with those people? Or is like, it seems, it seems interesting to me that the survey stated this as a challenge from the perspective of the data scientists, which, which I, again, and this isn't about blaming right. anybody, right? But it's kind of like, are they right. stating it as a challenge because they think it's someone else's responsibility or because they're having trouble getting those team members to participate or they don't know how to participate? Like they don't know how to be useful to the data team. Do you have any feelings on that? I know there's several questions there kind of. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's a that's that's a loaded question. So, so I, I think, well, first of all, I think I, in the study I looked at, I found that even even business people who have really good quant skills are are happier with the outcome of their data science projects compared to business people who lack those quant skills. So, I think a, a good first step would be to kind of kind of get a good baseline about who knows what about about data and analytics. And it's always and I tell this to everybody I meet. Take an intro class to statistics or just uh, just a, a basic stats course, uh, just to give you an idea about you know how data can be used 
the kinds of things you you can do with it. You can predict stuff. You can you know you can look at historical uh, data, things like that. And if you give give people that kind of that base knowledge, I think it'll help them understand the value of data, and they may want to be more involved with with these kinds of data projects. At least at least they'll have some sort of common language with a stats person who wants to convey maybe a complex idea to them. So. So I, I, rec- I recommend to everybody take a, just a basic stats course, just so you know the kind of, kind of the, the language of data and analytics. So moving on to the second one, and I, and I it's kind of interesting to think about whether or not the the first challenge fed into the second one, and this was data science results were not used by the decision makers, and it makes you wonder. Well, if you didn't have a good problem to solve, right. maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's why they didn't get that, used yes, in the first exactly. place. But, can you give? Yeah, do you have you experienced or or kind of overheard examples of this happening? And do do you know why they happened? Yeah, yeah, I've I've run into this in my own uh, consulting career. Uh, I've had one example, or maybe a handful of examples, where you know you, you have a, a question that they pose. It's pretty clear. You analyze the data, and you show them here's the results, and they don't follow your your act your 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 recommendations because they don't believe what you're showing them. And I think that's due to confirmation bias, where that's just you know the, the, the tendency to seek out information that supports your prior beliefs. So if they already go into a study with the belief system and you show them something that, that counteracts their beliefs, they're less apt to, to follow that advice than if it supports their current beliefs. And I've seen that a few times. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's human nature, right? So... You just, you just got to tell them this is why the study's valid, and just you know, and hopefully they'll have other people in the room that will c- can help argue your point. Where you know this is, I mean, listen to this study because it's valid, it's reliable, and it, and it makes sense. Um, again, an- another reason why I think uh, business decision makers don't you know take heed is is they lack basic knowledge of stats, right? Like I said earlier. So, like I said, if, if a business person has has a, a good understanding of, of quantitative methods, they are more successful on their data science projects than business leaders who don't have that quant skill. And that makes sense because it's a it's a mathematical endeavor, looking at data. And if you can if you understand, you know the 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 uh, the fundamentals about you know how to analyze data, you're more apt to believe studies that 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 you're doing. So, um, so there, Do you, the, uh, that's, that's good feedback. I appreciate that. Um, the not using, um, results part. So do you ever hear about, or maybe in your own practice prototype out? Like, so as, as a matter of matter, of course, a lot of times and when we're designing products and services, we are prototyping and we're creating mockups of stuff before we, we code it. And the reason why is to right. try to understand how would it be used in the real world before we invest all this technology in it. So, for example, if you're building a predictive model for something, is there a common la- is is there a common practice of prototyping the findings, making essentially making up some findings and saying here's here's some ideas what might happen. How would you, Mister Biz- Mister Mrs. Business Stakeholder? react to this. What we found is that actually Florida is the number one state for whatever, loan requests that are not approved, whatever. I can't even think of a scenario, but the point being some kind of unexpected (laughs) uh, finding and understanding how they would react to that prior to the data actually supporting it. Do you ever do any type of prototyping like that to actually investigate how how it will be adopted before the the experiment happens? Or is, is it too hard to know what the possible outcomes might be. Well, I kind of always think ahead about how I want to present the data once I, like, for example, I'm a big, I mm-hmm. do surveys for a living. So I, I always kind of think ahead about how, how am I going to report these results? A bit of spider chart, graph, bar, like 3D. How am I going to do this? So I always kind of think about those things. But I, I, but I haven't done what you, what you recommended, and I think that's a really good idea, is, is, is showing or just telling the, the recipient of this information some hypotheticals and seeing how they react. I've never done that, and that, that can be something that sounds kind of useful, actually, because you, you'll get a sense of, of maybe their mental blocks about what you're trying to do and what you're trying to show them. And by talking to them 
and giving them hypothetical situations about if the results were like this, what would you say? I think that could go a long way in helping you design a better study or at least at least present the results in a way that are more effective that kind of resonate with them and their and their and their mindset. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna try that next time. Well, cool. Let me know how it how it goes. Um yeah, it, it seemed seemed interesting to me that that I hadn't heard about this before because it's you know what one of the kind of the in the in the world of usability testing which is stuff you do on the back end of a design to figure out that's the actual process of testing the design to see if it was usable and it accomplished the goals that you set out for and one of the as you were talking about the believability part one of the common questions you get is well well how many people did you ask well actually a yeah, four out of five people couldn't actually finish the checkout process that's how bad it was well you only talked to five people so how many do we need to talk to and the, the answer that you sometimes hear recommended for designers is how many would it take for you to believe the data? It's not, and you forget <laughs> about P values and like right. statistical you know, significance and all right. this. And you focus on what that per that stakeholder actually needs to believe. And you can tell them like statistically or from our practice, we don't need to keep hearing the same thing over and over. Four out of five is enough. And plus our experience says we have a problem with this and it, we can exactly. make a change now. We can keep testing it. So you tell us how much you need to believe it. So I wonder if the same thing could happen, that practice could happen too with these data science projects where if you find some wanky result like that you're just not expecting, you know, what, what do we need to do to back that up so you believe it's not correlation, for example, it's actually causal or whatever, you know, whatever it may be. It, it kind of gets to that, the non, uh, that part isn't so much the math and the science, that's more the psychology and knowing how people react because you're going to have... Right certain business stakeholders that still want to kind of shoot from the hip and experience, right? Their gut tells them something. And sometimes that gut is really totally. informed. You know, it, 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 they may not be able to explain how it works, but we can't always explain our models exactly. either, right? So, but. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so when I try to convince somebody of, of a certain point of view, I try to use multiple lines of evidence. I don't just rely on a single study if, if I can. You know, there's, there's, when I mean, you look at any journal, there's, there's tons of studies that have been mm-hmm. done over and over and over again. And if they find the same results, then that's a pretty good evidence to me that, okay, this is a reliable result. Um, so that's why I, t- I kind of take that approach. It's not just show them a single study, but here's a handful of studies that show the same thing. Yep. 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 Um, the third topic uh, to restate that was in this uh, Kaggle survey was the inability to integrate findings into the organization's decision-making process. So I didn't see the format of the question here on the survey, but I'm assuming this kind of suggests that there was some type of successful project or product or something that occurred, but then it failed to get into the the organization's decision-making process. So this makes me wonder if, again, this, this what I perceive to be lack of what I would call a product management skill set in some internal, uh, in some non-tech companies, for example, not having that person that looked beyond the findings and like, yep, we're able to predict X. And then it's like, off to the next project. And it's like, well, wait a second, there's a whole bunch of <laughs> right. stuff we need to do to take advantage of like making the sales right. campaign target this region or, you know, whatever the <laughs> Whatever it is, can, can you speak to to this third one? Yeah, I think I think it, it was still it revolves around the fact that maybe they don't have the right team member as part of the data science team. If you're if you're if if you're doing a study and trying to understand uh, uh, call center support and you don't have a, a call center support person on your team, then who are you going to give the results to? to make changes happen. Or if you're trying to develop a product based on some data insights, you don't have a product person to, to think about that in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain mindset, then it's just gonna die right there. So again, you, you have to have the right team members with you in order to move, move that, those results to the next level. I mean, I've, I, in, in, my, in my line of work, I consult, so I, I don't, I, I don't have the authority to dictate to my clients, you have to do this. You know, I just say, here are the results, and I'm hoping I'm talking to the right person who can actually implement those, those recommendations that I'm suggesting. And if, if that person is not in the room, then, then those words may fall on deaf ears and n- nothing may ever get done, which, which is what I suspect happens a lot as, as results you see here. Why, why, so, do you think, why do you think that happens so much, though? Is it... it, it, it it seems like, especially if 
executives are looking at, you know, data science and, and AI as a strategic and initiative and we need to invest in this and you get to the end of this right. project and then it's just like, all right, that was the deck and on to the next thing. It seems really funny to me that someone yeah. wouldn't be yeah. saying, what did we get out of this? What are the next steps? Like now that we have this model or now that we have this what feature or whatever the heck it is, it seems really weird to me that this just gets dropped. Like it doesn't get yeah. integrated properly. I don't know. Like, <laughs> it could be a lot of things. I mean, you think about how the time frame with which things get done and, and things can change in a company. And maybe it's just, you know, you, you say do this and so they do that and you don't see changes for like six months, but you're on to the next thing in, within two months. So, so how do you, like, how do you keep a team focused on on the on the metrics and not and not be distracted by the next shiny thing that's, yeah, that's yeah. coming down the pipe. That's tough. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. If you have an answer, <laughs> let me know. Well, I, again, I I'll, think I'll this gets you. back to at the beginning of the project. If we don't understand this kind of how our our work fits into the bigger picture and how is it going to be integrated, like that has to be part of the project, and you know a lot of this is almost, it's almost consult, it's con, consultative work, right? It's okay. If we had, you know, let's say that we're able to right. come up with, with a, a predictive model for X, like where the next, you know, sales increase is going to be, what would we need to do right. to make sure that the sales organization is able to leverage this data? And this gets into, again, service design and thinking about the end customer experience, the employee experience, the business right. processes behind the scenes, and not just looking at it like at the time that we put together the PowerPoint deck to communicate the data science findings, there is some follow-on work. That's never the actual, that's not the end. And in a lot of ways, that's the beginning of something. Just like design is, right. is the beginning of the journey. It's not right. the, when you finish the design, you've just put a concrete hypothesis into place. You haven't actually built it and, and, and put it into practice with customers. It's a right. design. It's a hypothesis. But knowing that what those follow-on steps right. are, it, to me, is really important in, in figuring out who the team members are that are required. What departments need to be involved to make sure this happens? And are they aware of the work we're doing? Do they know that they're going to have some responsibility to change some business processes or whatever it may be to adapt this work? Um, and and th this actually sort of leads into my my next topic, which is, um, have you been here? I, I, I've been reading a fair amount about kind of this growing role of what's called an analytics translator. Uh, I, I don't like the title. It sounds very, uh, it sounds very <laughs> low level and it sounds like something you do after something else has been done. Like we take really bad and un hard to understand stuff and try to make it useful to some other people. And that's not what I understand the role is really about. But are you familiar with this? kind of growing role it's kind of no 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 i have it but but go on I'm, well I'm effectively it's my, it my understanding is it's it's someone that's actually upstream in the process and they're interfacing between the business and the analytics team so they're effectively playing what again right. what i what i would think of as what to me should just be called product managers even if they're not actually building a commercial <laughs> right. product like if you're working at a a farming, you know, John Deere or something like that. You may not be creating any commercial software products, but that the role and the skill set of the product management person is effectively what I see very strongly tied to what is called an analytics translator. Um, but th this gets into whether or not there's a distinct huh. role. Do you need a distinct role and person for this? Uh, or do you need to get the data teams and the analytics, the leaders and the data science leaders more skilled in some of these kind of soft skills, the psychology pieces and working with teams and looking at service, you know, looking at services holistically, not just the, the data science part, uh, but understanding how does our work fit into the overall business so that it actually delivers some type of value. You know, right. I, I don't know if that's do, do, I'm sure in some places you do need a dedicated yeah. body for it and other places you can stay lean uh, and, and, and just improve the quality of the work that the existing team is doing. Right. The whole, the whole notion of, of an analytics translator to me sounds like it's, it's somebody, and it could be a product manager. It sounds to me like it's somebody who, who's trying to translate these quantitative results into some like, like 
easy to yeah. understand words mm-hmm. for the rest of the team. Now, which is all, which is awesome. I think that's 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 a good thing to do. But instead of focusing on trying to get the best translator, why not try to raise the level of the team's knowledge of math and statistics? And because it would it would be easier to communicate results to somebody who under, has a basic level of understanding of data and analytics compared to somebody who has no idea what, what, what a mean is or mm-hmm. what a variance is. So, so I, and I, and I, and I agree with you that you need to increase this, maybe the soft skills, communication skills of the, of the data experts, but also on the same token, increase the, 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 the tech skills or the math skills of business people. So, so, we're, so we're all playing on, on the same level playing field where we can talk and we, and we don't need an analytics translator because when I talk to you, you understand me and vice versa. I don't, I don't want to have to go to some, some uh, uh, intermediary to, to translate what I'm saying into something that's meaningful to yeah, you. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, wonder about, I wonder about the practicality of that and especially as you go up the, right. the business responsibility chain and you get into more senior level management and people whose time is, is pretty bogged down to begin with, how much it is that... that the skill of the translate if it if you want to call it translation fine to to me it feels like can we can we also help the data and analytics people to provide better visualization better storytelling better communication of the information in a way that their stakeholders can understand it whatever their particular and you may have different audiences right like one audience may want to see let me see your data let me see your findings another person really want give me the conclusion you can pepper in the supporting evidence, but I, I trust you. This is why we hired you. I don't need right. to know what the p-value was. I just want to know, like, can we sell more here or not? Right. And what, what do you guys think we can do? Like, how many more sales can we do? And what would it take to, to make this happen in the business? They're looking at it from that perspective. And to me, I, I, I think there's some shared responsibility there, right? Like, you have to know something about technology if you're going to work on software. Right. And if you want to work on data, you probably do need to have some understanding. But realistically, I don't see, I don't know, I would find it hard to believe that most senior level decision makers are going to, you know, take a stats course and, and all of that to understand it. Could be wrong. Uh, could be wrong. I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, well, in, in, the, in my new company I'm working with now, my goal is to educate everybody mm-hmm. on just basic stats. So we have these things yeah. called lunch and learns. And you can present you know, any topic. So my goal this year is to do like two classes per quarter on just basic stats. It, nothing sophisticated, you know, t- you know, throw some charts up there, frequencies, correlations, t-test, just basic stuff. So they can start seeing the value of data and what it is. In fact, going forward in our company, we're, we have to include key performance indicators in all of our projects. And, and if we don't have any, the project just stops until we get mm-hmm. a, a KPI instilled. We can get that from the client. We can make some for ourselves to make sure we're, we're, on, we're on task and on track of, of being successful for a client. So, so maybe that's just a matter of just, just being in the field for, for many, many years. You just, you just know more stuff. And maybe that's just if, you, if you're a senior, senior level executive who's been around the block, you know, 30 years, maybe you just know more and they're easier to talk to because they, maybe they get numbers because they, they deal with numbers on a daily basis with you mm-hmm. know, finances and so forth. Got it. The, uh, on, on, by the way, on the, you, you reminded me when you're talking about the, the training work that you're doing, I don't know if you're familiar with um, this website called Seeing Theory. On, on the, it's on the Brown University. It's, it's seeing-theory.brown.edu. And it's a visual introduction to probability and statistics. Uh, and it's, I visit it every now because my background is not in, in any math or data science uh, or statistics. So, uh, but it, it's a really fun, uh, well-designed website that has lots of visuals uh, to go along with uh, different statistic terms and, and how they work. Um, so I, I could put, I'll put a link to the show notes in it. But if you're doing that kind of work, you might, you might check that out. It's, uh, it's really well That's designed. Cool. I will. Um, at least the last time I looked at it, it was it was. And there's also a course that's being taught at the University of Washington by two professors. It's called Calling Bullshit, <laughs> and it's it teaches us. It's great. It, it, they, and all the classes are online. You can you can watch them on YouTube, and uh, it's excellent. 
it's they teach kids or students how to think critically about information they're oh. given. Uh, it's wonderful. It's calling bullshit. It's a it's a, a class offered at the University of Washington. Got it. Bob, do you have any other uh, like closing advice or anything for um, for data scientists or people working with them that are trying to create data products and and better analytics tools? Uh, we've talked a lot about maybe getting uh, some just some training uh, on statistics in order to better understand kind of the world of data scientists. Yeah. But any other like general things about how, how we can help? Yeah. Yeah, I, I got some advice for some either you're an aspiring data scientist or just a data scientist in general is that you can't know everything, right? So focus on improving skills that are part of your your core strengths. So, uh, it, and, I, and I found before, data science skills kind of tend to occur together. If you're a quant person, you know a lot about quantitative methods. So maybe you should dive deep into that and become an expert in whatever you want to become an expert in in that that field. If you're into programming and technology, focus on that. And if you're a subject matter expert, dive deep into learning about that field, right? So, so just know your lane and just become an expert at that. And the, the more you know, the more successful you'll be at your projects. And also make sure you work with other people who complement your skills. Again, you, you don't know everything and you can't know everything. So bring other people on board. And I know for, for me, I'm much more successful when I have other people working with me who have skills that I don't have. It just, it makes life easier. Now, and if, if you're an executive, uh, you need to understand that data science is a team sport. So you'll never just hire a single data scientist and say, oh, I got my data scientists, we're all set to go. You need a team of people with with uh, with a diverse skill set that work together effectively. So just keep that in mind if you're an executive trying to you know instill data science into your company. You need to hire a, a team of people instead of just one. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. It's so similar to doing effective uh, product design uh, work as well. You can't you can't really throw something over the wall to a designer and expect them to understand what the <laughs> right. problems are and how we're going to measure this stuff. And what, what, what is a successful task completion look like uh, in an application? Why did people come to the site? You know, that the, the software, all that stuff, it, it, inquire, it requires the cross-cultural or cross-departmental uh, skill sets and, and, and having the right stakeholders in the room and all that kind of stuff. So I, I find a lot of parallels uh, with you uh, on that. So, so cool, man. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, where can people uh, find you? What's the best? Or is LinkedIn the best? I, I'm going to put your LinkedIn uh, in the show links. LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. You can find me on Twitter, Bob, Bob e. Hayes. Hayes. Okay. Uh, and my, my personal site is Business Over Broadway. And I'm a, now I'm a senior research uh, director at indigoslate.com. So you can find me at any of those places. Got it. Awesome. Well, I will uh, definitely put those links uh, in the show notes. And uh, man, this has been a really fun conversation to, uh, to have with you about this. Right. Today. I appreciate yeah, yeah. it. Cool. Well, yes. keep me posted awesome. on things, especially if you do some prototyping. Uh, I'd love to hear how that goes. And uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll stay in All touch. Right. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.